Welcome to the Lock Sports Cast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news and sometimes interviews. This is episode 64, recorded August 21st, 2021. I'm your host, Charles Current. In today's episode, Impressioning in China, first pick of the Multi Lock Omega Plus, picking a Ferrari, the longest picking streak, the Mile High Lock Sport Club, Schlage Week, meetings, new black belt, lock picking and safe cracking in movies and TV, a journey to black story, a crazy locksmith story, a strange lock story, sales, giveaways, and more. You can subscribe to the audio version of this show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. If you don't already have a Podcasting 2.0 compatible app, you can find it at newpodcastapps.com. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube or Odyssey. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. Some apps limit the length of show notes and the ability to post full links, but you can always find all the show notes with all the links at thelocksportscast.com. And you can find video clips of some of the stories discussed on our Clips YouTube channel. Link to that will be in the show notes. First up in the news this week, we have a Twitter post by Naomi Wu, who said, China has a whole separate lock ecosystem than the U.S. It's mostly dimple locks here. Because of that, impressioning is still fairly widely used. I was talking to Deviant Olaf about our lock ecosystem, and this inspired me to search out some videos. First, foil impressioning. Next, a sort of string impressioning. I've only seen it used on cross-profile keyways. Odd and interesting. And the last one, she says, this is a newish, a few years old, foam pad impressioning. This is a technique I had never seen before. Interesting stuff. I recommend you go check it out, especially the, uh, the two that we don't normally see, which is the string and the foam impressioning. And we have what appears to be the first public pick of the Multilock Omega Plus Cruciform Lock by George Jim. His video is called number 183, Multilock Omega Plus Picked and Gutted. Really large form factor lock, quite cumbersome to deal with, it looks like, and the cruciform profile. So really quite unique and a first public pick, it appears. So go check that one out. And Hogmaster13 put out a video this week picking a Ferrari 488 door lock. It's a automotive lock. It's a, it's a wafer lock, but it has some interesting serrations or false gates. I'm not sure what you really would want to call them, probably just serrations, but really add a little bit of complexity to it. And I did a quick search and I couldn't find anybody else picking it. So this might also be technically a first public pick of this lock. Anyway, interesting little bit of kit there. Go check it out. And I've received a note from a couple of different people on this next story. Over on the UK Locksport forum, there's a picker who goes by Tony that has been picking at least one lock a day for, as of Thursday, 962 days straight. I really think this is quite the amazing accomplishment and worth recognition. So to Tony, I say very, very well done. That takes some real commitment. So good on you and keep it up. I hope to see you at a thousand. And John Locke has started the Mile High Lock Sport Club, and he made a video explaining and demonstrating what he means by the Mile High Lock Sport Club. Sounds like you need to pick a lock while airborne on a plane to become a member. There is a channel for the club on the Panda Frog Discord server. And they say the first 25 people to join will get a free membership sticker. So I will have links to the video and the Discord in the show notes. And next up, over on YouTube, want to say congratulations to Albert LaBelle for reaching the 2,000 subscriber mark. He put out a tweet announcing that he had reached that 2,000 subscriber mark and said thank you all so much. And a shout out to Sparrow's Lockpicks also says he will be doing a dual giveaway on his channel coming next week or this week as of when you hear this. So congratulations to Albert. And when that video comes out, I hope to add it to my giveaway section. And this week, Holly brought to my attention a video by Devian Olaf about the Schlage 
D keyway and why there's no Schleg D keyway. And that kind of led me down a rabbit hole because that was part of a series of videos Deviant made last week called Schleg Week, which he goes over the different types of Schleg keyways and blanks and the reason for them and some of the history behind them. He has a playlist created for the series, and I will link that in the show notes if you want to check it out. The different videos in the series are the first one, day one, making sense of Schlage keys and keyways. The description says, the Leashy 2-in-1 style of pick has captivated many security professionals and amateurs alike, but what exactly is this new SC20 model that, I, that we've been seeing pop up? Is there an SC20 lock? No. This tool is based on the SC20 style of key, so what's that? In this video, we discuss the many keyways and lock designs that exist in the classic series of Schleg products. This will help you understand how and where the new Leashy tool can be used and whether it's something you think you need or not. The second video was called Who Actually Needs Leashy's New SC20 Pick? And the description of that one says, The Leashy 2-in-1 style of pick has captivated many security professionals and amateurs alike, but if you already own an SC4 Leashy pick tool, do you need to upgrade to this latest version? Are there situations where the new pick might be less suited than the previous model? That's the topic of today's video. The day three video was the biggest name in Schlage keyways. It says we've talked about Schlage classic keyways and mentioned how, despite looking similar, none of the Averse product line is cross compatible with one another. They are all slightly unique and designed to only accept one of the lowest level key blanks. But what if you wanted a lock that would accept multiple varieties of the Schlage key series? How about a lock that would accept the SC1, SC4, SC8, SC9, 7, and 10, and more? That would be one large keyway. Well, it exists. We discussed this mysterious and massive Schlage P keyway in this video. How does a Super Leashy SC20 pick tool perform in so wide a keyway? Watch and find out. Day 4's video was entitled, Why is there no Schlage D keyway? And this is the one Holly shared. It says, Almost everyone is familiar with the Schlage C keyway. Some of you, after watching these videos this week, are now aware of the Schlage's E, F, and G keyways. But why does the series start with C? What were the A and B keyways? And most baffling to me, why is there no D keyway? Well, after lots of searching, I finally found the answer. And Day 5's video was called Lockpicking ASMR. And he says, I hope you all have enjoyed Schlage Week as much as I have enjoyed putting it all together for you. I must admit, I was surprised when I looked and it seemed like there was very little lockpicking ASMR content on YouTube. I had always planned on showcasing the Leashy SC20 pick going through the whole Schlage Classic product line. And after a whole week of videos, I know you folk must be getting pretty tired of hearing me talk, so this seemed like the best idea. Anyway, I'll have a link to that playlist in the show notes. First up in meetups, Holly also shared Lockfest 2021, which is taking place September 25th through the 26th in the Czech Republic. I will have a link to the website in the show notes. And shared on the Lock Camp Instagram page was a September meetup for Alamo City Locksport on September 4th at 1900 hours at JB Knife and Tool in San Antonio, Texas. So I will have a link to that post in the show notes in case anybody in that area wants to attend. And of course, Lock Camp is still scheduled for November 12th through the 14th at Lockhart State Park in Lockhart, Texas, and tickets are on sale. So, of course, links in the show notes. Moving on to the Lockpickers United belts. This week, we have multiple belts to announce. For purple, we have Vintage and I Am Noob ABC, both earning purple this week. Brown belts, we have Strix and Somebody with their new brown belts. And red belt, Mog Lambert, congratulations, Mog, on your red belt. Then we have one new black belt announcement, and it reads, Let's applaud Peace Weapon on his achievement of reaching black belt with his ability to impression locks and his demonstration of picking 
the Evil Eva ICS, the Dom IX Twin Star, the Asa Twin Combi, and the Asa Twin 6000 with gin spools. Along with your pings of celebration, make sure to ask him about some of the unique locks that Portugal has to offer. Very, very well done, Peace Weapon. Glad to announce your new black belt. For those of you not already familiar with the Lockpickers United belt system, I will have links in the show notes for the official page, as well as some videos that explain the system in case you don't want to do a lot of reading. We have two new first records for speed locks. The first is by, I'm going to say, Aswa Picklock. First record for the Abus 64 Ti 20 in 3.069 seconds, and also for the Abus 64 Ti 50 in 43.4 seconds. Very well done. A couple of new records for other people to try and beat. Now it's time to take a quick break. Say thank you to the people that made this episode possible. We'll start with the Patreon subscribers. We have Medler, Pandfrog, Michael Gilchrist, Starrylock, Williams Brain, Dave to be deciphered, Pat from Uncensored Tactical, PH Picker, Three Raccoons in a Coat, Cherell, Patty Cakes, Dr. Hogmaster, Mog, John Locke, Rat Yoke, Mr. Picker, Cranky Lock Picker, the chief content producer for this episode, which is the person that sent in the most content that was used, is Cherell again this week. The other content producers for this episode are Chef Mommy 411, Georgia Jim, Good Guy, Gravity Karma, Holly, I Fisk, John Locke, Joshua Gonzalez, Locke Kraken, Locke Sporter, Michael Gilchrist, Mr. Picker, Panda Frog, Pocket Woman, Tony Varelli, and Type Regal. Thank you to all of you for helping to keep this show going by providing me with the information I need. And with that, remember that this show is only possible because of the support of the community. So if you're getting value out of this podcast, please help return a little bit of that value by sending in your news, links, events, giveaway information, anything you have that's Locksport related that you think the rest of the community would benefit from knowing. You can send any information you have to podcast at thelocksportscast.com or any of the other methods listed in the show notes or at thelocksportscast.com slash support. Don't forget to share the show with your lockpicking friends, either in person or online. You can leave a review on your favorite podcast platform or a comment and a thumbs up if you happen to view on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast on most podcasting apps or on the YouTube or Odyssey channels. You can also donate via PayPal or subscribe on Patreon. If you are a Patreon subscriber, you do get a private RSS feed that allows you to get the episodes just about a day early most times. If you support the show with a donation or information that I use on the show, I will give you credit in the show and on the show notes. First up for the state of the podcast, I would like to thank Chef Mommy 411 for the review that was left on 628-2021. I hadn't been checking this because nothing had been posted for quite a while, and I just stumbled upon it today and i just wanted to say thank you and i was just going to read it here real quick it says i truly couldn't imagine anyone else hosting this podcast besides charles current he does an amazing job of hosting pulling material from all sources and social media platforms researching for new info news etc to tie everything together in one place he has news stories giveaway announcements recent developments in locks and tools and all things locksport related I'm so thankful he took this podcast on and ran with it. It's available on all your favorite podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube for those that don't listen to podcasts otherwise. Top-notch cast and material. Thanks, Charles, for all that you do to make this podcast possible. No, thank you for all you do to make this show possible and for that wonderful review. There is a new segment in the second half of the show today called Journey to Black. If you recall, last week I asked for people to share stories about their journey through the belts to black belt. And I'm going to try and share those as they come in one story per week and in this new segment at the second half of the show. And I will keep it going as long as there are stories to share. May have to take some weeks off if there are no stories, but really would like to make that a thing. If you would like to send me feedback, you can go to the locksportscast.com slash contact or just email me at podcast at the locksportscast.com. Feedback can be kept confidential or I can share it on the show. Your choice. 
You're welcome to submit a note, video, or audio recording if you want to have it on the show. Just make sure to keep it reasonable length, polite, work and family safe, not political, and not just community drama. And I Fisk noticed in the comment of Lock Noob's Real Skeleton Keys video a link for a book called A Treatise on Fire and Theft Proof Depositories and Locks and Keys. It says old, but nice if you like that kind of info. And you can read it online or download. It's about a 45 megabyte PDF. I will have a link to that in the show notes, as well as the Lock Noob video that it was left in the comments of, which is called Real Skeleton Keys. Looks like an interesting video. I actually haven't had time to watch it yet, but it is on my list to watch. And now on to lock picking and safe cracking in movies and TV. First up, we have from iFisk, America's Got Talent, where a guy has to pick three master padlocks before a descending chainsaw cuts his head in half. He's chained to a door that's kind of laid back in an inclined position secured with three chains and three master padlocks. A chainsaw is slowly descending as sand flows out of a counterbalancing bucket. He says he has to pick all three locks to escape before the chainsaw reaches his head. Being the skeptic that I am, I watched the video very close, paused it a few times, replayed it a couple of times to make sure what I was seeing. Some interesting things I noted. The pick that he shows beforehand doesn't appear to be either a hook or a rake, just a straight shaft. And he doesn't have or use a tension wrench of any kind. The master padlocks are a model with a removable core. There is no demonstration beforehand to indicate that the locks actually require a key, and thus no indication that they even have any pins in them. So. I have no problem calling this fake. Just a show stunt. He just puts the pick in, wiggles it around for enough time to draw some suspense, and then turns it to pop the lock open, moves on to the next one over and over again until the chainsaw is a few inches above his head, and he quickly gets out of the last lock and gets out from under it. It is what it is. It's theater, but it is definitely not lock picking. And then there was a video shared by Good Guy or at B and E A to Z on Twitter. It says, Love me some Charlie Santori. His Instagram is also solid, and the video is Master Safecracker rates 10 safe cracking heists in movies and TV. How real is it? The description says, Safe technician Charlie Santori looks at 10 safe cracking scenes in popular TV shows and movies and rates them based on realism. Santori owns Santori and Son Lock and Safe in Los Angeles. He looks at Army of the Dead, Ant-Man, The Italian Job, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Money Heist, Season 1, Episode 1, Cradle to the Grave, Batman Forever, The Thieves, King of Thieves, and Thief. So a link to that video will be in the show notes. I'm also going to include a link to an article in the Atlantic about Charlie Santori and to his Instagram account, since those things were also shared by good guy on Twitter. I find this video to be highly entertaining and educational, so I recommend everybody go check it out. And then South or Lockpicks shared a tweet, said, when you're watching a movie at home and you realize they're using your C2010 Slimline lockpick set, and a commenter on that tweet asked which movie, the answer came back, The Hitman's Bodyguard with Samuel L. Jackson and Ryan Reynolds. And then in another comment, somebody said, your picks were used in Bravo's Spy Games too, because we sold the picks to them. So I will leave it to you to go to that Twitter tweet to see who that was. Also in the comment section of that tweet, a video was shared from SaintCon 2020 that I had never seen before, and I wish I had seen it sooner. So it's SaintCon 2020 Lockpicking Hollywood, and it says, Colin Jackson convenes with some lockpicking masters like Medler, Corncob, and Jimmy Longs to critique some of Hollywood's best and worst moments from popular and obscure movies and TV shows. 
So I will definitely have a link to that one. I watched it, loved it, good stuff. And I will also drop a link in the show notes for the 2016 Hope 11 talk, Tool and Friends, Lockpicking in Real Life versus On Screen, that was with Deviant and his friends up there on stage, because it's kind of the same thing. Goes along with the theme here. And I also ran across an article this week called The Vault Cast and Character Guide, in which they announced that The Vault is coming to Netflix. It says Spanish heist movie The Vault is coming to Netflix after a domestic release earlier this year and contains some familiar faces fans will recognize. In 2021, Netflix's The Vault sees a ragtag group of criminals attempt an ambitious, safe cracking heist under the cover of the 2010 World Cup. The Spanish effort, The Vault, debuted in select territories as early as January 2021 before an understated U.S. theatrical release in March. Despite not dropping in Spain until November, The Vault can now find wider audience through Netflix. The plot begins with a salvage merchant recovering treasure from a 17th century shipwreck, only for the Spanish government to seize his loot. Desperate, the protagonist assembles a team of amateurs to liberate the gold while the country is distracted by the World Cup. It will be interesting to see how accurate their heist is. I might actually watch that one. And as pointed out by Mr. Picker this week, lockpicking also comes up in stories in other forms of media. Mr. Picker shared an episode of Creepy Pasta on YouTube that has a quite accurate description of lockpicking. He says he came across the lockpicking story in Creepypasta, thought it was interesting since it sort of goes into a bit of detail. The actual section you're looking for, this is a pretty long video, but the actual section starts at 33 minutes and 30 seconds. It mentions lockpicking in about 7 to 10 seconds from there and goes into a bit of story and details on lockpicking. Doesn't last super long for that lockpicking section, but... It is interesting, and it's actually fairly accurate, so good on the writer of that. They obviously had some working knowledge of lockpicking. And now we'll move on to our Journey to Black story. This one was sent in by Type Regal. Type Regal said, All right, I got into the hobby of locksport a few years ago when I found Lockpicking Lawyer in Bosnia and Bill's YouTube channels and the Lockpickers United subreddit shortly after. Not exactly an original background to getting into lockpicking, I was studying electrical engineering in college at the time and have since graduated. I started with your normal master lock and ABIS white to orange locks. I was thrilled to finally get my hands on something I thought was impressive when I got my 5240. I ended up skipping and going quickly past green belt after I got the 7240 and an American 1100 together from Amazon and found the American 1100 easier. From blue to brown was a blur finding weird locks that I felt were easy prey and was, for me at least, very quick advance through the belts. Mako's SFIC was really a joy to pick and it was definitely a relaxing pick. The Smart Key Gen 3 was brown at the time and is definitely a great experience for starting into tool making. Now, red was a chore to begin. I started by looking for a lock that I was confident I could pick, so I ordered the Matura C43 Plus because I thought it looked like a Yale Superior. Boy, was I wrong. That lock was a slog of disassembly and progressive picking. The other lock I went after for red was the Alloy Classic. I ended up making a cutaway and 3D printed spacers to progressively pin the lock. I also made one of the jankiest picks known to man, but it worked. Finally, Black Belt. Since I had already had black credit for the classic, I decided to go for another ab boy. I tried to do some research on the ProTech and got very little information as only Terror and Hux had picked the lock and both had not shown their pick head. I worked for at least a month to develop the head and 3D printed spacers and a cutaway to test with. Finally, I was confident enough to get it picked fully assembled. I take secrecy as a challenge and wanted to give that pick design to the world. Congratulations on your black belt type regal. It was a really good accomplishment and especially picking the ProTech. Very, very impressive. And everybody's going to have their own parts of 
Locksport that they find easy and other parts that they find difficult. And that's one of the things I kind of want to highlight with this series. A couple more stories in line to share in the weeks coming. So stay tuned if you're finding that interesting. For the locksmith story for this week, we'll head back to American Key Supplies Crazy Locksmith Stories. This one says, So get this. I quote this lady like $89 for an evening lockpick in San Francisco. Nice neighborhood, old lady. I get the door open in two minutes. She's in the door right away and locks it behind her and tells me I'm too expensive for two minutes of work. I need to go away. She says I'm trying to rip her off. She was quoted by me. $89 on the phone, so there should have been no surprises. I called the cops, they showed up an hour later to tell me it was a civil matter, nothing they could do. I told them that by law she has to show me her ID, otherwise, who knows who this lady is that had me break into some house. They go talk to her and check her ID for me, but they refuse to give me any of her information. So, on one hand, they tell me to take her to small claims court because it's a civil matter. On the other hand, I still don't even know the lady's name. I sent the cops back in there to get me her info. She sends them back with a check written out for $89, to my amazement. And then she yells out the back door as I'm walking away, I'm going to cancel that check in the morning. Of course, the check bounces, which means I have to pay an additional fee. But dude, I'm not going to let this lady get away with it. So I have to pay more to file a small claims court case, then pay more to have her serve. A couple of months later, after she's served, the court date is set. She calls me all sorry about how her husband had passed away, blah, 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 blah. In all, she ended up paying me $175 or something for all those fees. A lot of trouble on my part, but I made her pay for it in the end. Not not every... uh lockout is a is an easy smooth process and we don't know for sure if her story was true or not she could have been grieving which would affect her emotional state but at the same time going through the trouble of canceling the check after paying him the first time was probably a really poor decision for our strange lock story we have an article called once upon a time in duluth Bank bandits were busted at Fifth Avenue Hotel. It says that in May of 1921, a trio of would-be safecrackers was apprehended before they were able to use their guns and nitroglycerin. The full article was written by Christian Lawler, and I will have a link in the show notes if you want to check it out. But the story goes that in 1921, three men were believed to be planning a robbery, and they were thwarted when a chambermaid at the Fifth Avenue Hotel found a gun beneath a pillow. When the three would-be bank bandits were arrested at the Duluth Hotel room on May 5th, authorities found in their possession a cake of soap, old leather gloves, dark gray sweater coat, a new toothbrush and overalls, not to mention four ounces of nitroglycerin, three guns and cartridges, a bottle of fuses with detonator caps, a flashlight, and electrical connections for cutting into current, it says. And at the time, the News Tribune reported that Duluth police trap trio as safe crackers. Duluth's chief of police, Warren Pugh, led the raid on James Flynn, George Jordan, and Robert M. Owens, guests in room 26 of the Fifth Avenue Hotel who were tattled on by a chambermaid who found a loaded gun beneath a pillow in the room. The small crew of officers busted the three men when they returned to their hotel room. Were the bad guys behind the robbery of six recent theater robberies in Milwaukee? Pew didn't think so. Based on the technique used to crack the safes and the equipment carried by the men, but because of a recent bank robbery in Coleraine, one of the officials wanted to get a good look at the men. The chief of police said, I'm satisfied these men had a big job planned for Duluth. And furthermore, I'm convinced that all of them are not amateur criminals. True enough, Owens admitted to serving time following a burglary in Oklahoma. He and Flynn were also wanted in Sioux City, Iowa for jumping bail. There too, they carried nitroglycerin. 
And within a year, George, Jordan, and James Flynn were back in the news in their attempts to break out of a Stillwater jail. The article also says that in January of 1856, Scientific American featured an introduction to nitroglycerin as a safe cracking tool. It was not to be taken lightly by the Times Yegmen, a slang term for burglars. And at the time, they noted that the modern Yegmen, however, is often an inartistic, untidy workman, for it frequently happens that when the door suddenly parts company with the safe, it takes the front of the building with it. All right, you can check out the story at the link provided to the DuluthNewsTribune.com. I just thought that was an interesting story of an old planned bank robbery, it would appear, that never actually took place, foiled by a maid. And I don't have any other lockpicking criminal stories this week, so we can move right on to sales. Pretty much the same as last week. We have 20% off the Ridgeback set by Law Lock Tools with the code RIDGEBACK20. We have 10% off 3DLocksport.com with the code LSCAST10. And we have 15% off Mako Locks with the code by Mako. 10% off at UKLockPickers.co.uk with the code GIFT. Giveaways. We still have Lock Kraken doing the August giveaway, the hashtag Kraken August 21. Panda Frog with the hashtag Panda Frog 21 August giveaway. CLK Supplies with the hashtag Lock Boss giveaways that they do every week. And the Lock Sportscast with my monthly giveaway for a pack lock or a gift code to hooligankeys.com. I know I'm behind in those. I'm sorry. I've been working extra. I got called in because somebody called out sick. Remember, the show needs your support, so please continue sending in your news, links, giveaways, events, and anything you have that's Locksport related that you think the community would benefit from. You can send it to podcast at thelocksportscast.com or go to thelocksportscast.com slash support. You can find multiple ways to help the show and to contact me. Thank you for your continued support. 64 episodes without one missed yet. Thank you very much. And remember to keep it legal. <laughs>